Welcome to Breakthrough Barriers with Damali. I'm your host, Damali Peterman. On this podcast, we invite you to share a conflict that you need help navigating, and I, along with a guest co-host, will share what we would do in that situation to help you reach your breakthrough. Welcome to the show. On today's episode, we are thrilled to have Morris Levy, guru, founder, and all things awesome of The Yard. Morris, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. So much fun to be here. Oh, it's super fun. I mean, it's great to actually have you in the studio and away from The Yard. Tell me more about yourself. It's nice to be away from The Yard for a little while today. <laughs> uh, a little bit about me. I am a father of six, um, husband. That's the priorities there. And uh, I do run my business. Uh, called The Yard. We started in 2011, and we have thousands of companies working under our roofs today. Um, avid exercise nutrition guy. Uh, love to play music, although these days not that much time allocated there. And uh, that's really who I am these days. I spend a lot of time working and, and investing time into my family. That sounds awesome, and I love how you identify what your priorities were. You know, six kids. I think I told you before, I'm the oldest of seven, so I can relate to that. Husband, father, and then also an entrepreneur. And, you know, kind of having all these folks in your in the yard space must be amazing, too. They must call you, like I know I do, often to kind of see how you're doing and to check in as well. It is the best part of what I do by far, uh, the relationships that I have and the, the people that I get to meet and the industries that I see happening within the spaces and the brilliance of, of the different people doing unbelievable things. And that's something that really took shape very early on for me. You know, I thought I was in the real estate business and I realized I was in the service business. But then when I saw things growing, it was it was incredible. And that's one of the reasons that we called the space the yard, because ideas grow in the yard. You could play in the yard and you could work in the yard, but it's it's something there's something always fun going on. Oh, that's awesome. I never knew that was the impetus behind the name. I know that I love being in the yard. And Morris, did you know that you are partially responsible for planting this podcast bug in me? I did not know that. Yeah, yeah. You are one of the first people to actually connect me with someone to be on their podcast. And I really appreciate that. That was really awesome. You're welcome. I'm happy you enjoyed it. Yeah. And so, you know, for those of you just tuning in for the first time, I'd love to tell you the format of our show. Basically, we have people to call into our hotline and to share a situation with us. It could be a conflict. It could be something that they're just pondering. And they really want to benefit from having someone who's not a part of it, uh, just kind of picking their brain and getting their thoughts. And that's what Morris and I are here for. And so basically... You know, we are going to play a message for the first time. Morris has not heard it before. And on that message, someone's going to ask us a question. And we're going to say what we would do if we were in that situation, just kind of to provide a roadmap, if you will. How does that sound? It sounds fantastic. You know, not a lot of people, a lot of people don't have great people to bounce things off of. Not that I'm so great to bounce something off of, but just someone else to bounce something off of is great. Because when we're stuck in our own circle, sometimes it's hard to think out of the box from our perspective. I agree. And I like to call it kind of collective wisdom, right? They can kind of benefit from our collective wisdom, not only the caller, but all of our listeners who are tuning in. And for those of you who are tuning in, what are you waiting for? Pick up the phone, call our hotline and ask a question. And I assure you that someone awesome like Morris will be in the studio with me and we'll try to give you some feedback. Let's do it. Without further ado, we'll play our first message. You have you one, have mes- one message. <laughs> Hi, um, this is Angela, and I'm actually calling to find out what are some of the best practices for um, employers when an employee leaves uh, or gets fired, so basically quits or gets fired. Um, so yeah, I would really love to hear what your thoughts and feedback are on this topic. Thank you. Hmm, that was an interesting question. So Morris. much, so, so much for starting with the easy ones first, huh? <laughs> well, you're a pro. We, you, I don't think you want us to like warm you up. I think you're ready to go. You know, people people come and go. It's unfortunate, you know, and and especially for me, I I'm I'm a people person. I get very attached to my people. I love my team. So when someone leaves, to me, it's like, oh no, why are they leaving? But very quickly, I I I think they're the best practice. And it's funny to hear a question is even helpful and beneficial to me. Because I don't think about it, I just do. But um, it happened to me this past weekend, and one of the first things that I do is I say, "Okay, what were the strengths and weaknesses of this person? What were they really good at, and what, where where can we improve as a company? Because we're not stuck to the way they were doing something anymore. And a lot of times we get very comfortable with someone, and we end up living with their deficiencies, as 
as a balance, not as a balance, but because we're not, you know, we want the, the good that comes along with them. So you don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater. That's right. So the, one of the first things I do right away is look at what their strengths were, what their weaknesses are, were, and what where, what direction we want to go in with with a new hire. I like so I that. that so question. learning from, you know, kind of the strengths, weaknesses, you can call them pluses or minuses, and then thinking about the new person coming in, how you can adopt, uh, if there's anything that we can change as employers, right? Yeah, it's an opportunity. It, it is an opportunity for growth, both for the company and for, you know, the individuals that you are onboarding. I like that. I think, too, some best practices. I, I kind of see this question in two parts. Um, one for the employer. So like for us, for example, as employers, if someone is leaving and whether it's like a voluntary or involuntary, so voluntary separation means like, you know, they're just going off for another opportunity, right? Involuntary, that means they were probably let go or fired, right? And so one of the things that I think about as employers, and I love that you're starting with the person first, um, the second thing that I think of is kind of how do we protect us, Right. And maybe that's like kind of my my legal hat coming on. And so did this person have any passwords? Right. Did they have any equipment? Did they have any keys? Um, What did they have? And did we have a process in place to make sure? Because like you said, people come and people go. And so was there anything in place to make sure that like if they had computers, we have all our computers back. If they had passwords that we've changed all our passwords. If they had email accounts, we kind of disconnect those accounts, things like that. So that's kind of the first thing that I think think of after kind of the, well, I guess the second thing that I think of um, is like, what do we need to do as a company to make sure that like tomorrow nothing weird happens? I don't know if I'm supposed to disagree with you on your own show, but I think it's too late at that point. You think so? Those things really have to be part of the plan earlier on. Because once they leave, if they're disgruntled and they don't want to give you a password, that's a problem. Uh, So I think those systems need to be in place a little bit sooner. um, And... You know, I always tell my people, and I, I say this, you know, anyone can get wiped out at any point. Uh, there's a couple of different kinds of employees, I mean, and myself included. I mean, we have to think about that. We have to make everything accessible. Some people think that if they hold everything close to the vest and they're the go-to person, that they have job security. And you know what they have? They have, they have the ability to be stuck because then that's all they could do. But when you make your responsibility and your role something that anyone can step into, then if you're great, you're free to do something else because someone could step into your role. And that's how I look at it. And when when people are coming in, I let them know that right off the bat because if they make everything that they're doing transparent, they're free to to grow into other areas. So it's not from a fear-based, oh, I need their password because I'm not going to be able to get in. But no, everything should be clear and open so that the next person could do your role so that you can grow and you could elevate. Um, It's also... Perspective, you know, it's exciting when somebody leaves, whether they leave for a good reason or a bad reason, that there's going to be a new process and that there's going to be new life into a role because there's there's personality, there's there's all different facets. And, and, and my business is so much of a people business because my team is an extension of who I am. And if they can't put out the message that I want to deliver to my members, it's not, you know, it's, it's not going to be the atmosphere that I want. I always say you can't fake a vibe. So true. So true. I like that you said that because it's a lot of upfront sort of investing into the people that you're bringing on the team. And I've always heard this saying, hire slow, fire fast, right? And so it sounds like you're really finding the right cultural fit for your people. They're an extension of you. You want to make sure that your members, and I'm one of them, have that great vibe. They feel welcome. And I have to say that since I've been there, it's been an amazing team. I love that you said that they can kind of be transparent so that they so that they can grow. I think that's exactly what you want is the ability to have someone else filling your shoes so you can continue to rise through the company. Systems. I totally agree with that. You have to have systems in place. I think also having that portability allows for the model to be replicated, right? Correct. That's how you have a scalable model. Model, And so I totally agree with you. I think sometimes, too, um, people also are so focused on the onboarding that they don't think about the what ifs, the negative things, right? And sometimes that's a problem because when you're bringing on someone, you may want to think about, you know, okay, so what if this person leaves after two months or three months? What is set up in place? Do I already have some folks that, you know, have interviewed that may be able to come on? Um, What other systems are in place to handle with kind of, let's call it offboarding? 
right? And so that's what I'm thinking about when I think about kind of this particular question, um, because it sounds like this person is is an employer, and they're asking us, you know, like, and you gave some really great insight. So one, focus on your people, finding the right people, put a lot of time and energy into finding the right person. And then two, figuring out how to help those people grow, create opportunities for them to flourish within your company would probably make it less likely that they'll go outside of the company. Is that right? Yeah. You know, it, it, atmosphere inside the company is a huge, is, is, a, is a big difference. Also, you know what, today I have someone, I had someone come in kind of it was kind of to a test run before he gave notice he wanted to see can i do this job am i gonna let this person down because i said this is an important role to me i'm gonna give you this job and i'm gonna give you all the room to hang yourself can you do it and he said no one ever asked me that before you know people just want the job they're so concerned to getting the job and they don't think that when i get the job and i'm gonna be in there and i'm playing without a net now we're gonna help that person we're gonna grow that person but they have to know that they could do the basic functions before they could take it to another level. I don't want to start teaching f- the basics. So he came in, he spent the day with the person that he's replacing to see if he can do it, if he wants to do it, and if he's going to do it. I like that. So like a test run. Test run. That's a great idea. Um, one of the things that I also like about that is it gives you a chance too to see if he's the right fit, like not just the interview and the resume, but kind of putting him in the place to see, you know, can he do it? And so what did you think? What did I think? That's a good question. <laughs> I wouldn't I wouldn't have made him know if I didn't think he could do it and if I didn't think that I wanted him to do it. Um, whether he thinks he could do it, whether he wants to do it is on him. Um but, you know, also it's a big responsibility as an employer, as a dad. And I look at it like this, you know, I have, I have a lot of responsibilities. If I'm going to hire someone who has a job and they don't work out, I, it's business. Yeah. It's a business. So they have to know that they could do it and it's got to be on them if they can't do it. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. And you know what I'm, it, what it sounds like to me too, Morris, is that there's kind of this mentorship component of what you're doing too. Do you realize that? I do. Maybe to maybe to a fault. <laughs> maybe I should just let people do their job. But I think I do. I do. Once once things are in a good direction, you know, you got to be able to count on your people. They have to know what the expectations are. Yeah. So there's one way to do it. It's a dictatorship, but that doesn't work. Which is probably explains why people love working with you. I hope so. Yeah. I hope so. I think I would like to work with me. You're pretty you're pretty phenomenal, I have to say. I appreciate it. I have that. to say. And I'm as you can probably hear, still super excited and like in awe that I have you on my show today. I'm happy to be here. <laughs> and so what other best practices can we think of for this person who's who sounds like um one, we've told them what to do in the beginning, right? So going forward prospectively for other employees. And then two, like what are some other things we can think of to help this employer with navigating best practices? Rethinking the role itself. Sometimes when we have an employee and they're really, really good, they'll take on a lot of things that aren't their job description. So that job description, that role that they're filling could change into something completely different. So what do we want the new person to do? Do we want the new person to take on that full role? Is that what is going to be the new job description? Or is it going to be uh, you know, going backwards and then who's going to do those other things? Yeah, That's really, really important. That's actually really key because when you were talking about strengths and weaknesses of the former employee, I think that's something to think about because was it because of the role? Was the role not a good fit for the person? And so rethinking the role is a great way to start, especially if you have to replace the person who who was who left, who was fired, right? And so thinking about how you hire, do you interview by yourself or not? Maybe it's not you, but is it one person or a panel of interviewers? So... We'll have a first pass with the person who does the screening. Mm -hmm. And then if they're going into a marketing job, they'll sit with the marketing director and Mm -hmm. then they'll sit with me once they pass all others. Um, And that's usually how it goes. And so I like that because I think sometimes um, what I hear is that entrepreneurs may only have one pass. And you it, you can really benefit from having multiple opinions on a person, right? Because different people will see different things. And so I like that there are two or three layers before the person is, is given an offer to come on board. And so that's one best practice that I like. So think about the hiring stage and making sure that it's not just you doing the interview, right? 
And then we talked about a few other things. What about for once people have left, you know, people, sometimes you're afraid that they may poison the well. I hear that saying a lot. So how do you kind of re-instill, re-instill uh, hope and confidence in people who are still there? Hmm. That's a tough one. I don't know if you can, you know, people are going to think what they want to think. Mm. And um, if you have solid principles and, and people know what you stand for, you shouldn't have to, you know, that sounds like politicking to me a little bit. And I don't do that. You know, I, I send out a very clear message. This person left because they weren't a good fit. This person moved on because they wanted to grow and in and, and an area that we, we don't have for them. Um, and if we're just very clear, you know, people could, you know, once a person is at that point, they're, they're probably not going to be around too long. Hmm. I like that. So controlling the message. So getting in front of it, putting the message out there and saying, hey, it's, this is what happened and it's coming from the top. It, you know, it's, it's about transparency all the time uh, because this way when, when something goes down, they know that you're not making something up. They know that if I tell them the, the, a reason for something, that it's the truth because I'll give them the real reason unless it's like strictly confidential, which... I'll just say, I'm sorry, it's confidential, but that's, that's, that's few and far between, I think. Yeah. You know what, Morris, it sounds like you have a really great environment for people to work in. And there are a lot of great things that uh, we can learn um, from you as an employer. Uh, I think that that sounds like a lot of best practices for Angela. What do you think? I think it's good. I had one more, but I can't, it's not coming to me now. Yeah. Well, the good thing is that, Angela, you're always welcome to call back. I would love to have Morris on the show again. And just in general, we love to hear follow up and feedback from folks that call in. Like, what are you doing? What are you implementing? What did you think of some of the suggestions that we had? And kind of just keeping the dialogue going. Okay. And so without further ado, let's play the second message. You have you one, have one, one message. <laughs> Hi, Damali. I was hoping you could help me with um, an issue that I frequently um, encounter while running my business. Um, what do you do and what do you recommend when you have difficulty working with a client and communication in terms of calling and emailing and expectations regarding um, being available all the time are outside the scope of the agreement and the clients are taking advantage um, of um, our services um, by, uh, you know, calling us at outside of business hours and, and really going beyond what, what should be acceptable. How would you have that communication with your client or prospective employee on how to respect um, working during um, normal course of business hours? Thanks so much, and I look forward to hearing from you. Bye. Loaded question. <laughs> a lot of different facets there. There's the normal business hours. Yeah. And then there's living beyond the contract. I think we should stick to that. Okay. Because I think that that's really a more prevalent issue when, you, when you're doing business. Um, you know, people tend to over negotiate sometimes and people tend to uh, try to get more than, 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 they bar- than, than they're willing to pay for. Yeah. Uh, and maybe, that'd be the, maybe, that's the, maybe that's the same thing as over negotiate. Um, I like this topic because I like to negotiate, but I like to give. And if you don't give in a negotiation, you're not going to get. And it's really, really baby stuff. It, it's, it's, and I, I hate to put it that way. It's so simple. It's like really playground stuff. Yeah. You got to trade. It's got to be a fair trade. There's no winning. There's no winning because then, 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 then it's a loss. If somebody feels like they're losing, there's not, it's not equitable. I don't care if you're in a service business or unless you're, unless you're selling someone something, you're never going to see them again. In my business in the, at the yard, what we do is we sell an expectation. Mm-hmm. And then we see that person every single day. We're not selling them a car and then we're never going to see them again. We're setting an expectation. Um, so when you look at a contract like that, setting an expectation, it's just going to be very clear. And then there's always going beyond the contract. But you can go beyond the contract in both directions. Yeah. Someone could do more than they were supposed to do uh, when they, than, they, than they had previously thought they were going to do or not only intended to do, but promised to do or committed to do. Um, and then, the, you know, the, on the other side, the flip side, someone could, could demand more. And again, it, it comes down to being very, very clear. Um, sometimes people don't understand the different sides of the business. And uh, and I I could I could relate it to my to my business, which is easier. But even even in, in uh, when someone's giving a service, 
the, the amount of, like, let's say you have someone who's you hired to design a, a logo for you. Mm-hmm. You know, you might think, oh, they're sitting there with a sketch pad or whatever. Or, you, know, you don't know how long they're putting into it and how much time they're going to put into it. And what that and how they value their time and how their expenses come in. And if that person could explain and set an expectation for their client, there's an understanding there that 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 should be respected. And then if they're not respecting at that point, then they're just not a good client. Yeah. Because you explained it to them clearly. So that's kind of my input there. Yeah, I mean, I think you're right. It is a loaded question that can go in different directions. And I think you're right. If you focus on the contract, if the contract says, you know, nine to five, just to make it a pretty simple um, hypothetical situation and people keep contacting you at like 7 p.m. or 9 p.m. or if it's supposed to be Monday through Friday and you're being called on Saturdays and Sundays, I think there are a couple of things. Um, one, some people, and I know these people, um, they – just are thinking about it at that time, they don't expect a return email. It's just that that's the time that they had to contact you. And, you know, they're just like, oh, I just want to get this off of my off of my plate, off of my to-do list, get right? It to to-do get it list. onto your to-do list. Right. But it can wait until Monday. The problem is people don't always communicate that. Um, and one of the things that you said that I loved was that you have to compromise. Compromise means that both sides give something. There's, you know, otherwise one person's going to feel like they're not getting a good deal. And, if, and to your point, if it's not equitable, it doesn't feel good. And so you have to be a little bit accommodating on both sides. Um, I always say that there are, diff- there are five different ways to respond to something. And we like to be in the collaborative space, but oftentimes we just compromise. Okay, you don't get everything you want, I don't get everything I want, but at least we're both walking out of here with something, right? Um, but what, it ha- what happens a lot to me in my business, especially being a lawyer, is that people contact me all the time um, because I'm a lawyer. And this happens to doctors too. You know, I don't know if you've ever been into a church, but if you're like a doctor or a lawyer, people think you have all the answers to everything all the time. <laughs> and it's very flattering. You know, it's kind of nice because they think that you have all this information. But sometimes things are like really like totally not in your field. And you're just kind of like, uh, I really want to help you. I don't know the answer or I just wanted to buy some juice from Whole Foods <laughs> and I, I didn't know I was going to have to answer like a legal question today. That's great. And so sometimes, you know, and then, you know, it goes both ways. I mean, sometimes like I may have a question that I want someone in my circle to answer for me and maybe they're a doctor. Maybe they are, you know, a judge. Maybe they're in a field where I'm like, I have this question and I know it's outside of your normal time and I know you have a process for me to be able to get to you, but you know, can you do me the solid? And so like I get it because I'm sometimes on the side of providing the service and sometimes I'm on the side of receiving the service. And so my mantra and my motto is usually to treat people the way that I want to be treated, right? Um, and I know I, I'm notorious for sending an email at like four in the morning, not because I want a response, but something might wake me up. I'm awake. I can't go back to sleep. And then I'm like, oh, I meant to write Morris and ask him a question. And so I might do it. But what I think I need to do more often is say, you don't have to respond to this until I just want to do that. Right? I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I love that. We, we we know each other for a while now. We we always often talk about how similar we are. Yeah. Um, you're probably too giving. I'm like that. You know, I I'll go out of my way and I'll do things that aren't aren't expected. Um, but you also sent something else that was very good. Is you don't have to respond right away. Yeah. Um. So in in my email, I have drafts and I write drafts and I send them later and I or I hit send later. Yeah. So that people don't get them at the wrong time. You also touched on something nine to five. So that struck a chord with me because coming up in a family business, nine to five was frowned upon and there's no such thing. And that was a while ago. And even more so today, you know, nine to five is is, is less prevalent because of our phones and we're really working all the time. So true. So, um, you know, what may not be ex- what might not be expected of you during the day because, you know, you can get to it later. Conversely, the same thing is true. You can get to, if you're going to get to it later, you have some more free time during the day. It's so true. And sometimes I think I just said it the same both ways, but I think the oh, listener should get the idea. Totally. Like I totally got it. I'm sure we have some pretty awesome listeners. But, <laughs> but you know what's funny is like when you said that, what it made me think of is you're right with technology being like 
literally at our fingertips, it is really easy to shoot off a message quickly. Sometimes, though, like it could be so fast because you're trying to fit it in. At least this happens to me all the time. I'm trying to fit it in. It goes across fast. And I forget some of the formalities. I forget to say, how are you doing? I forget to say, (laughs) you know, you know, and then I feel like kind of a like jerk because I didn't like say something. So I hope that there's that benefit of the doubt given when you're using like, you know, when you're texting as opposed to like calling or emailing. Right. I try not to uh, answer important emails or fire off too quick really because it's um for me my first thought is generally wrong i need i need time and space between answering funny stories i used to go tour locations and uh i would walk around with a pad and i'd write things down and i'd talk to the people behind the desk or whoever you know and tell them what's wrong um and even if i said some nice things they would only hear the wrong things Mm. so i stopped that i'll still walk around i'll still check but I don't give anyone information right away. I'll put some space in between it or I'll put a person in between and I'll pass the message and let them know that the space could be cleaner or whatever it may be, but either put some time and space between it so that I could refine the message and and, or put another person in between it so that they could soften my message because I come off rough. I do. When people when people get to know me, they realize that that's not where I'm coming from, but that's certainly how I come off. We are so much alike. It's crazy. <laughs> the same thing. When's your birthday? August 7th. Okay, I'm February. Oh, when I'm in February? Aquarius, February 1st. Oh, wow. Yeah, true Aquarius. Not even on the cusp. No. Nope. Well, you know what's cool about that? Well, one, of course, we get along before. What is Aquarius? Air and I'm fire. I think I'm water. No, you I don't, water. I don't, I don't follow stuff. I, I just don't either. I just made that up. <laughs> I just figured if someone's in the same month, that they could probably maybe be similar. Well, you know, my mom is an Aquarius and she's like amazing. And um, I, a lot of these things I learned from her, right? And I do the same thing. I try to put some time in between it. I try to put a person in between it. And then I'm going to add this to it. I also do something that I call rule of three. If I see like things that are going on, I never give a person more than three things at once because I just think that it's too much. It's just chaotic. And if you distill it, if you think about it, they may fall into a few different buckets, right? And so, for example, you were talking about like, oh, it could be a little bit cleaner. Okay, so maybe there was five different rooms that had different things going on, but can I group that into a category of cleanliness, right? Or... um there was an email that I got was inappropriate. You call me something inappropriate. And then I got this weird text. I'm going to group that into the category of communication. And so I always try to do things like that. Never more than three things at once because more than that. I three just, things to one group? To to one person. Oh, so three group. things to one person, but one the, those three things could have multiple parts. No, they would be the categories. Okay. So, for example, if there were like five rooms that were clean, I wouldn't be like room one on one was, you know, that were not clean. I wouldn't say room one on one wasn't clean, one on three wasn't clean. I would just say, you know, we have this thing of um, like, you know, maintaining decorum that we should figure out for, you know, the rooms or something like that. Or, you know, I want to talk about communication. Communication is something that I think we can improve. And this is how we can improve it in these ways with written communication, with verbal communication. And so I try to group things into bigger categories because I can hear a theme and I can see kind of the bigger picture. Does that make sense? It does. I'm learning. I'm thinking yeah. and learning. And so this kind of comes from mediation and conflict resolution theory, um, kind of distilling chaos into a few concepts because it's easier to address like one, two or three things than 10 things, right? And also our minds don't want to like focus on all those things at once. I think I read recently that we have an attention span that's even shorter than that of a goatfish. So I don't know what's happening to humans, but it, can, it seems like we're regressing. Absolutely. <laughs> There's that's more very good. No, I, I learned something today. That, that was, that's very good. Yeah, it works. I have works. to see how I'm going to put that into practice for myself. Yeah, it really works. And I use that you know, across the board with people that I work with. So even if I'm working with the client, I think about, okay, how can I kind of put these things into categories so that it doesn't seem like this deal was completely bad, right? Like what, what are the good things? So I like what you said. Like before you would combine some good things with some negative of feedback too. What I found, depending on the audience, is that sometimes people, if you say the good things first, they don't hear the negative things because they're still kind of, you know, basking in the glory of the positivity. And then I've learned that if you say the negative things first, then, you know, they don't hear the positive things because they're just like, oh, you thought X, Y, and Z about me? And so they're really, I haven't found any great way to combine both uh, constructive and positive feedback. So the same thing I find doesn't work with different kind of people. Mm -hmm. Some people need to hear the compliment first and some people need to hear the the, the complaint or the criticism first. 
Um, but you know what I find always works best is a, a question. Yeah. Because if you could ask a good question and you get into the mind of how they see it, then you know how to respond. And that's that, that's really tremendous because if you're a good listener and you hear what the answer is, yeah, you could find your way in. We can teach a class together because I think I agree with you a thousand percent. And I'll take that even a step farther. I think there's a difference in the types of questions that you ask. And so you could say, tell me why you did this, which sounds kind of accusatory and like you're interrogating them. Or you can say, tell me what happened. Right. right. And what so, do you think? Or what do you think? Or what do you think happened? People That's my favorite one. You, people oh. love to tell you what they think. <laughs> you just tell me, what do you think? What do you think of this color? Oh, that's it. It can go on forever. Right. What I love about that too is just diversity of thought is so key because I swear to you, whenever I ask that question, people say things that I would have never thought of. And I love asking that question. What right. do you think? Wow, that's what you're thinking? And you were thinking you were completely, we were way <laughs> off. Way off, way off. And so I think we've given a lot of information to this caller on ways to kind of manage clients who are, you know, this person feels like they're taking a little bit more than they had bargained for in the contract. And so I think some of the things that we said include um, being clear about, you know, being clear about what's expected, managing expectations, communicating, being clear in communication, and then perhaps finding some ways to communicate this, you know, discontent to the client, you know, or, or maybe even saying things like, oh, you know, I'm happy to do this for you. It's not within the scope of our agreement. Um, if we continue to do this and we may have to revisit the terms. So basically, because the client may not remember, or maybe there was some intermediary between the client and you. And so that person negotiated the agreement and the client doesn't know what the actual terms are and they're just going to keep going until you say something right I hear that that happens happens, happens all the time yeah. right Morris? you got things have to be addressed early on that's really i think the key is addressing it a lot of people want to to close a deal and they think that let me close the deal and i'll address things later yeah because they don't want to screw it up they'd rather sign the deal than risk not signing the deal because they're bringing up all these other things yeah and that doesn't work because no. then you then you're gonna have to address, address these things in contract and then you need to call an attorney <laughs> yeah call a good one that's right <laughs> well that's fantastic uh please feel free to follow up with us we love to hear how people are doing we love to hear how you're kind of thinking of these things and also if you have any follow-up questions it'd be awesome to get morris back on the show that's anyway. it just two questions today i want to do another one i know it's just kind of fun right i that feel like a lot of you fun. know it's 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 always great to have like this great rapport and be able to kind of talk to folks, especially you. It's like they're, it's like a person is kind of overhearing our conversation, right? I'm overhearing my conversation with these headphones on. <laughs> I like to hear myself. It's talk. pretty legit, right? We have it's the headphones, great. the microphone. It's, it's a pretty nice operation. And so, Morris, I really want to thank you for being here thank today. Thank you so much for inviting me. You're exceptional. Love having you on the show. Want to yeah. have you back. Love the yard. I know you have locations all in, in many cities, in many states now. Actually, we, yes, we're in, we're in New York. We have eight locations in Manhattan, three in Brooklyn, and then one in Philly, one in Boston, and one in D.C. Wow. And soon to expand. That's amazing. That's amazing. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure being a member of the yard. Um, I like what you said before about why you call it the yard. I feel that every day I've been in other co-working spaces. Is, and I'll be honest, this one is my favorite. So thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Audience, I want to thank you for tuning in. It's been a pleasure to have this conversation with you and in front of you. Um, I'm your host, Damali Peterman, and this is Breakthrough Barriers with Damali. Continue to break through and have a wonderful day. Do you have any barriers that we can help you break through? If so, you can leave a brief message at 646-363- 6322 or on our interactive blog at www.breakthroughadr.com. Please follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn at the at sign B R E A K T H R O U G H capital A capital D capital R. I'm your host, Damali Peterman, and this is Breakthrough Barriers with Damali. Although I am a lawyer, mediator, and an educator, and many of my co-hosts will represent various professions, we want to be clear that we are not providing legal advice, counseling, or suggestions. Our goal is to provide a roadmap for conflict resolution to generate future conflict resolvers. Continue to break through and have a wonderful day.